And this morning, we're going into a brand new series called Armor Up. Can you say it with me? Armor Up. That's right. That's good. And um, we love it. I, I, I learned this week, uh, I was studying and I was looking at some different theologians and what their thoughts were on just the shield of faith alone. And because we're going to talk about the shield for a few moments this morning. And uh, today's kind of an overview of uh, the series that we're on in Armor Up. And we're going to look at spiritual warfare. We're going to look at the armor of God, but also tie it in with the, with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at those together. But I, I found out how actually enormous these shields were. Um, one, one author was t- saying that they were as big as, like, say, the back doors back there. It was, they were literally as big as a door. So these, these men were, were at war with a shield as big as the war. And so when they would say, armor up, like that, then they could put them up over themselves and hold them, and they can encounter whatever was coming at them. And so it's the same way as in Christ, and you're going to see that today as we open this up. But, you know, just some amazing stuff. I was thinking through as I was ministering in first service as well that today, I want to say this from me to you, it's, it's very basic today, all right? And maybe you know a little bit about the armor of God and some whys behind it. And I might give you a few things that you're like, ah, never heard that before. And by the way, um, if you didn't know it, um, my, my brother's coming up here. To, if you didn't know this, and I don't know that we've said it, but Cash the Turkey has a hole right in the top right here. And if you want to give or let your kids give through cash, you can just drop money there. That, that money goes to the same place. And so thank you for doing that, brother. That was a great illustration. Y'all give it. Y'all give him a big hand today. Amen. And uh, so, and so, yeah, you can do that. I actually had somebody come to me between services, my, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but yeah, we, we love doing that. My granddaughter loves it. She wants cash down at all times. And uh, she's all, if she goes in the attic with us, she always says, hey, can we put cash on the stage? She loves for cash to be up here hanging out with us. And uh, he's, a, he's a good turkey, all right? And uh, so don't hunt him, all right, amen? Uh, but uh, it's not turkey season anyway, it's deer season. But uh, this morning, as we look at this, I would say go ahead and get your notes out and, and get ready today as we look at this, the, so our armor focus, every week of this series, there will be an armor focus and a fruit focus. And what we've d- done is we've, Pastor Johnny and I prayed about this. I've never done anything like this before, but I, I can see it in the scripture. And so we thought, what if we tied these two together? Because we think spiritual warfare and immediately our minds go to, to battle, to war. And they should, because we're in a battle every day. Everybody say every day. And we are, and, but at the same time, we have to be able to minister with the fruit of the Spirit as we're in warfare. And as a soldier, uh, uh, you know, I spent, you know, 10 years of my life in the military. This, this is not easy, but it's Bible. And so you'll see it through this series as we walk through the closeness of these two and what it should look like as we do battle in the heavenlies. Okay, and so as you get your notes out, you'll see this. So today I'll look at shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and also the uh, faithfulness and joy. There's some key scriptures that we'll look at. Our main idea today is that faith helps shield us from the enemy's attacks, and our salvation gives us the confidence and joy to keep pressing on in battle. And so you'll see that as we talk about these today. As I define spiritual warfare, you can see it on your paper, um, as I define it today, and, and it is a long definition because it encompasses a lot, all right? Tap your neighbor and say, this is big, right? I mean, tell them, because we need to know this. We're in a battle every day. It's a battle for your life. It's a battle for my life. It's a battle for your kid's life if you have children. It's a battle for your friends' literally lives. You'll see that as we move on in this series. But spiritual warfare is an ongoing battle between Christians and the spiritual forces of evil rooted in the struggles against sin, temptation, and the influences of Satan and his forces. It involves standing firm, and you're going to see this over and over again in faith. Standing firm in the faith, I believe, is if it's not the key, it's one of the keys. We're going to use God's power and spiritual armor to resist the devil's schemes We're going to rely on prayer and scripture and the Holy Spirit for strength. And I was telling first service as a very young Christian, as I was being discipled, my mother and father-in-law were two of the people that discipled me, I can say this, the best. 
They were really good at it. And one of the things that my mother-in-law, the way she memorizes things is through song. And so one of, the, uh, one of the things that she does is she'll have a little jingle to Scripture, and that's how she memorizes Scripture. And so for the armor of God, which I believe we should put on every day because we're in battle every day as a Christian, if you're a Christian in here today, she had this cool little song that, Renee, that I learned from them and from Renee, and then we taught our kids, and now we're teaching our grandkids. It's the same song, but it, it, and it's just a, a neat little song to help you put the armor on every day if you don't already do this. And um, I'm going to get Renee up here to sing it with me. No, I'm playing. She's not coming up. I tried first service, but it didn't happen. But, but it goes like this, um, and this is, what it, this is what it sounds like, and you have to just deal with my voice, but um, I stand against the enemy through the power Jesus gives to me with the armor of God. I put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and the belt of truth. Shod my feet with the gospel, take the sword of his spirit and the shield of faith. Unto him we glorify, and his name we magnify with the garment of praise. Amen? And so, see, if, if when you put the armor on, I mean, you're ready for battle for the day. And so today, as we look at just a couple of pieces of the armor next week, Pastor Johnny will be up here um, sharing about some, some of the other ones, and, and then, you know, we're going to work through this with you. It's a perfect season for this with all the stuff surrounding, things going on in the world, things going on in our nation, and our state. We just went through a, spirit, a physical storm, so there's a lot here. But um, a couple of key passages that I need you to hear. The Apostle Paul brought this to light for us. Jesus talked a lot about the different realms, but the Apostle Paul talked about this. In Ephesians 6, he would say it like this, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But it's again, that's hard for us to understand because when we imagine war, all we know is what we know. And so Paul says it's not against flesh and blood, but rulers, authorities, against the powers of the dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He would also tell us in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have a divine power to demolish strongholds. We love to just fight. Before Jesus got a hold of my life, I love to fight. That's why last week, some of y'all know I had a black eye all last week. It wasn't from fighting. But in the old days, it was cool to have a black eye because everybody knew you'd been fighting, right? I'm sorry. Some of y'all don't know anything about that, but that's, I, that was my life. And so before Jesus got, you know, got a hold of me. And so, but that's not how we fight now. You know, we, we fight now with, through prayer. And the power of prayer and through the word and with worship and with things like the disciplines of God, like fasting and like other things. There's so many different ways that this works. But spiritual warfare, we have to realize this, see? It's not just an external battle out here, but it's also an internal battle. It's what we've been talking about all this whole year, really, and truthfully, this internal battle that we're in. And so we're, it's where believers contend with a per, possibly personal sin and also spiritual opposition. And a lot of us, we're, de- we're consistently dealing with this from things from our past. And what does that look like? And how do we work through it? And this is what I've known for years. And um, I always say, I, I, realize, I, I realize people have a few different views on spiritual warfare. And it's usually, you know, as I look at, there's usually about three thought processes on it. Number one would be um, people that think there's a, there's a demon under every rock or behind every bush. I, I see that. And then, and then the second one might would be that call, Satan causes everything to go wrong in my life. That's not true. We make bad choices. Like, we don't make wise choices, and Satan might not have anything to do with it. We give him a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of credit when he didn't have anything to do with it. And so we have to be real careful there because we're always up against Satan. We know that. He is the enemy of enemies. We're always up against our own flesh, though, and then we're always up against the things of the world, things that are just going on. And then, so it could be a demon under every rock or behind every bush. It could be that we think that Satan causes everything to go wrong in my life. And the third one is is very scary to me. It's, well, I'm just not worried about it at all. I'm not worried about spiritual warfare. I don't have, you know, everything's just going to be all right. Well, I don't know. 
Paul gave us some very good instructions on this. Jesus talked extensively about this as well. We'll see it in the coming weeks. But So once again, let's think through this. Spiritual warfare is a fight between good and evil, like God and Satan, if you want to see it that way, that we have in the world today. The goal of spiritual warfare is to stimulate the presence of the Holy Spirit and hinder the work of Satan, okay? God is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. He's omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing, all right? And he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. Can I say this? Satan is none of the above. So, uh, you know, I, let's not be like this. Uh, you know, let, let's not be like this. I heard the story of two boys that were walking home from Sunday school after hearing a strong preaching on the devil. And one said to the other, what do you think about all this Satan stuff? And the other boy replied, well, you know how the Easter bunny turned out? It's probably just your dad. You know, I, I don't. <laughs> let's not go there. This is what I believe. So. There's a pastor down in Louisiana that pastors me from afar. He's, he's discipled me for years, even though, uh, you know, I've, I've never met him face to face. But uh, Pastor Larry Stocksteel and his dad, Pastor Roy Stocksteel, those men have a, had a big impact on my life. And that's why we're a part of the ark and so many other things. But uh, Pastor Larry would say it like this. A Christian who clearly sees the principle of spiritual warfare becomes a clear and present danger to the enemy. That's what I want to be. I, I, that's what we want you to be. That's what this series is all about. And so today, as we look at our soul tattoo, this is what it is. Remember, our soul is our mind. It's our will. It's our emotions. It's where the fight is. A lot of the fight is going on. Okay? Really and truthfully. And, the, and, then, but, and so then uh, tattoos are typically permanent. So if you could walk out of here with a thought process today for this week, it would be this, is that faith secures salvation and salvation fuels the fight because we are in a fight. Every morning when you wake up, I'm telling you, if you're a Christian today. And so what this statement, it emphasizes how faith is the foundation, remember this, that brings us to salvation through Jesus Christ. And then once we're saved, our salvation empowers us in the spiritual battles that we face daily. And so it's ongoing. This thing's going on. Faith unlocks the gift of salvation from a very secure, uh, you know, and then from that secure position, we're equipped, we're strengthened and to engage in spiritual warfare, right? And so knowing the victory is already ours in Jesus Christ. We're, we're, we fight from victory is what we do. We may be in a battle, but we're fighting from the victory that Jesus already has for us. I'll never forget, I, I had heard Pastor Larry actually talk about his dad, uh, they called him Brother Roy down in Louisiana, right? We, and so, but, but they, he, he talked about a young pastor asking Brother Roy one time um, at Bethany, he said, about power issues in the church, because there's a lot of power issues in, in church. He said, Brother Roy, what's the number one thing, number one lesson that you've learned? Pausing for a moment, Brother Roy replied, People are not your enemy. See, th this is what we have to grab a hold of. And if, we, if you follow the teachings of Jesus himself, you'll see this over and over again. You can't read the Sermon on the Mount and not know this and not see this. And so that's why it's, we have to keep going back there over and over again to see how to live our lives. Proverbs would say it like this. Solomon would say in Proverbs 25, if your enemies are hungry... Give them food to eat. If they're thirsty, give them water to drink. You will heap burning coals of shame on their heads, and the Lord will reward you. So as we, every morning, and, and th this has been a lesson for me. I've, I've been doing this for so, so many years, putting the, on the armor every day. You say, Pastor Arnie, do I have to? I don't know. But it's just how I've been living my life for all these years. And so in Ephesians 6, verse 13, Paul says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, right? Because it, it, it's, it, 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 you can't be human and not know that you're not going to face things. You will be able to stand your ground. The key is standing your ground. You'll hear that through the series. And after you've done everything, to stand twice. When we see it twice, it means a lot right there. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The breastplate of righteousness in place. Your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith 
which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword and the spirit, which is the word of God. I was reading the word for you today, uh, I think it was last week, and it started talking about faith because we're going to talk about faith. This is one of the tools we want in your tool belt. Because you can get a very good devotional, and if you want it in a very short time, from the word for you today. And two weeks ago, I think it was last week or either the week before, there was, a, there was a couple of devotions on faith, and it talked about cultivate what matters. And so this is what it said. Imagine you have two seeds in your hand, and you can only plant one seed. One seed grows easily, but it produces ugly Terrible tasting fruit. By the way, this is what happened to me this morning. Um, Joanne, John, Joanne was sitting at the table for, for turkey on the go out there, and I looked across, and, and there were three, I didn't know at the time they were small pumpkins. I, I thought they were big, good looking cuties. Come on, somebody. And so, and I started going over there, like, that's the biggest cutie I've ever seen, right? Because it looked so, but then I got there, and it was a fake pumpkin for crying out loud. But, uh, <laughs> So that would be one seed that produces ugly, terrible taste and fruit. Cultivating the other seed takes time and consistent attention, but the fruit it produces is beautiful and delicious. Which seed would you choose to plant, water, and grow? I want the good seed, right? In Galatians 5, what Paul says is this. that there, uh, He talks about two types of fruit in my life and your life. The fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit is basically what it is. The flesh refers to our desires, the things that would pull us away from God's Holy Spirit. Those desires, they produce things like hate, impatience, bitterness, selfishness, rudeness, chaos, and self-indulgence. And God, Scripture says, has no association with those things. But when we commit our lives to Jesus, He gives us His Holy Spirit The power of the Holy Spirit helps us crucify our flesh, the desires of our flesh, and put it to death. And when we crucify those desires, we create room. Everybody say room. For the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit in us that leads to positive life change. And that's what we're after. Remember, Paul said Galatians, in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You can say it with me. Forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Our flesh wants to get even, but the Spirit calls us to extend kindness. Our flesh wants to entertain crazy, sinful thoughts, but the Spirit of God calls us to walk in self-control. Our flesh wants to dictate our emotional response, right? But the Spirit calls us to walk in joy and to walk in peace. And so the fruit of the Spirit actually reveals that we're actively seeking God and we're rejecting disobedience. And so right now, if you were to reflect on your life, not your friend's life, not your spouse's life, anything else, what fruit is it that you're producing? This is spiritual warfare. This is the power of this thing. This is what we're after. This is how we're supposed to be, the hands and feet and mouthpiece of Jesus, right? Are you experiencing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, or or, or are there pockets of bitterness and anger and jealousy and self-indulgence in your life? What steps today do you need to take to crucify these beliefs and and attitudes that that are pulling you away from God? That's why we do this at the end of the service. That's why we have people up here to pray with you, to, to, you know, to stand with you in prayer. That's why we, at the end of the service we have a song, right? It's because we want to let the Holy Spirit show us what we need to remove and then allow Him to transform our attitudes, our actions, and our desires. And so this morning, as we look at these two pieces of the armor and the fruit of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation and the fruit of joy. The helmet of salvation and the fruit of joy. The helmet of salvation today... It, Paul said, take. So that means to me, I have to pick it up and put it on like a, you know, like, a, like a motorcycle helmet or a racing helmet or whatever it is. I have to take it and put it on. When we take the helmet of salvation and put it on every day, we're believing by fa- faith that our thoughts are protected from things like discouragement. How many of you got real discouraged in the storm? I mean, come on, it was crazy, right? All kind of stuff going on. And fear and lust. 
and a host of other things that can lodge in our mind. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote on warfare, you know, he, he would say things that like, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. In verse 5, it says it like this. We demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Whatever your struggle is, if it's not representing the things of the Lord, you need to, well, wait a minute, you're not coming in up here. We, we, you have to be able to do that. We don't just, oh, it's all so good. No, 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 it's not. That's not truth. That's not good. I'm not taking you in. You don't get to come in up here anymore, right? Salvation protects the mind. Like the helmet of salvation, it guards our thoughts from doubt and despair. I, I, you know, Paul would also tell us in Thessalonians, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, he says. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet of hope for salvation, we're a people of hope. We bring hope right everywhere we go. And so we have to realize that, that, that I, we say, you know, our words that and when we work DC downtown, we say we're hope dealers. Come on, somebody. Not dope dealers. God, come on, y'all. We're hope dealers. And so not only do we have this helmet of salvation, and there, but the other piece of salvation is having joy. When was the last time you were so joy-filled, right? Because there's joy in salvation. The fruit of joy stems from knowing we're saved even in the midst of hardship. We were never promised this easy-peasy, greasy life that everything was so good and it was just going to be like this. We were never promised that in the Scripture. If you read the Scripture, you're going to see over and over again there's hardship. There's things we have to go through. There's things we have to push through. You know, if you follow the saints of old, you're going to see all kinds of things. You know, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. You'll, you'll, I mean, on and on the story goes. And we just went through this, this, this storm, and my goodness, I, joy in our salvation, right? So the psalmist David would say it like this, and my question would be to you today. You know, because I'm asking about the joy in salvation, David said, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. In other words, Rodney doesn't have to hold Rodney up. God can hold Rodney up. Do you see that? Can you see that in the script? If you don't learn any other scripture this week, you know, just take that one right there. Right? Uphold me with a willing spirit. And so this week, the thing you're trying to do is, all right, Father, uh, you know, ask yourself, God, how, you know, ask yourself, how can I remind myself of the joy of my salvation, even when the battle feels overwhelming? Like, I, you know, right in the midst of it. I, I, I think, you know, that I think for one, that the initial thought is the most dangerous stage in any temptation. If you, if you don't stop a thought, I, I'm just telling you, it'll escalate and you'll take it in as a truth. That's why we're in the fix we're in right now. With so much untruth in this, in a nation that was founded on the truth. It's because it'll escalate as a truth. And, and then what happens is we act on a lie that we've believed and not on the word of God. And so we have to be careful about that because, uh, you know, when we do that, Satan, you know, we have to remember Satan, scripture says he comes as a, you know, as an angel of light, even though he's full of darkness. He's a liar and the father of lies. He's a murderer and the father of murdering. That's who he is. And so he, his ways are devious. They're very subtle when he comes in. And we have to be able to resist the attacks. Because this is what I know. And it's cliche, but it's real and it's truth. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. And so we have to actively re resist him, and, or we're in grave danger of being ensnared. We have to resist those thoughts or ensnared in a greater and greater levels of sin and bondage. And how do we do it? I think one of the best ways to do it, the thing that's helped me the most in, the, you know, in all these 36 years has been the Word of God. Because this is where the truth lies, right here. It's the sword of the Spirit. And so today, we're going to have a whole session on the sword. And, but the, I love it. You know, the sword of the Spirit, it's the Word of God. Remember this, this today, faith secures our salvation. Salvation fuels the fight. As we see the shield of faith, whether it's this big shield or one I can hold in one arm and fight with my sword in the other, the shield of faith, you know, we, we have to take it up, it says. Take up the shield of faith. We need to remember about faith. 
Hebrews tells us this in Hebrews 11, that it's the confidence in what we hope for. It's the assurance about what we do not see. In other words, Paul explained it in 2 Corinthians 5. He said, we live by faith, not by sight. Faith is my shield. I can, you know, say it with me. Faith is my shield. Come on, say it like you mean it. Faith is my shield, right? In other words, all, all, all the gospel is my shield. I can stand in confidence and relaxation today that everything will work out regardless of what Satan does. This is how I like to see it. If he took me out today, I'm going to be with Jesus for eternity. And so faith has the ability to block the enemy's darts. Faith helps us extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy, like doubt and fear and temptation, some of the things we've been dealing with. I love it because Paul would instruct us like this. He said, be sober-minded, be watchful, like don't stick your head in the sand. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He says, resist him, resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are be experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And you know, we've experienced a lot of crazy stuff over these last couple of weeks with a physical storm. But just can I tell you, for the last year, the continent of Africa has been experiencing a drought that has caused famine in unprecedented measures. You, you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's their bro the brotherhood throughout the world, there's, there's a lot going on. And so what we have to realize is that faithfulness is an action word. And as a fruit, it's the, it's faithfulness is the steady commitment to God's word and his promises, even when the battles rage. And so this morning, you know, I, an, another way we can say it from the book of Hebrews is this. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we can't see. And so the question for you today, because, you know, I want to see your strength, faith, and, I mean, your faith strengthened at such a high level. Like, what fiery darts are you facing right now? Maybe with your relationship with the Lord. Maybe with your relationship with, with your spouse or with your kids or with friends or something going on with your business, you know. How can you strengthen your shield of faith? And you know what I found out over and over and over again? I think it's through reading the Word of God. I think it's through worship. I think it's through fellowship with other Christians. I think it's through discipleship with others, but I also think it's through prayer. And so I close out today with three very small words for you um, as, we, as we close out, and it is the acrostic ask. There was a study done by Randolph Bird from the University of California in San Francisco, from the San Francisco Medical School. He, in 1988, this was years ago, but still, it still stands on the effect of prayer. It dealt with 393 coronary care patients who had heart attacks or severe symptoms. Half the patients were prayed for. Neither the patients or their caregivers knew who was prayed for and who was not. And those who were prayed for experienced fewer deaths, less need for drugs, and not one on life support. Can I say this today? Prayer works. And some of us today just need to pick up our prayer. In other words, number one would be ask of the acrostic. It's, it's ask. It, it's the simplest arena of prayer. A lot of new Christians, I've seen this over and over again. You ask, God provides. I've seen it over and over again. Little things, small things. The only problem with this level of prayer is you can get stuck here. You begin to ask God continually for things and to seek his hand instead of his face. And as Christians, we do and can seek his hand, but we want to seek his face. And so we don't just ask, we seek. In other words, mysteriously, answers to, to like your petitions seem to slow down or maybe even drag out. And these delays lead to questions and inquiries uh, of seeking. We have to seek the face of God. I, I learned early on in my Christian life that God wanted me to just, you know, not to just ask him, but to seek him. And so I would ask of you today, are you seeking him? And there are three ways that I think that are very pertinent to seeking him. Number one, of course, would be the scripture. The scriptures in scripture. And so I started looking up promises in scripture that gave me grounds for continued asking. The second thing would be in devotions. I developed a, a, a daily prayer time, a daily prayer time, right? 
And the third would be, and, and, and we do this twice a year, but would, and some of us throughout the year, but in fasting. Scripture, devotion, and fasting. I've learned about the power of fasting coupled with prayer, and it brings great breakthrough. Jesus himself even said that. And so we ask, we seek, and then the third way is that we knock. Sometimes you have to be persistent. As persistent, right? You have to be as persistent as the guy in Luke 11 that went and knocked on his door the story the parable Jesus told. He didn't stop knocking until the guy finally came to the door. And we have to position ourselves to knock at that level, you know. And uh, I've had things I've been praying about for years. I, I was doing a lot of knocking early this morning, praying with the Father, just asking for some things that the Lord's, you know, that I've been praying about. And it seems like they're stubbornly resistant to all my searching. It's almost like they're, it's a, trying to break through a locked gate. But the Lord wants you to enter into that realm. I would call that spiritual warfare. And so as we close today, let's go ahead and stand up this morning. Ask, seek, and knock. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Even online today, unless you're driving. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed all over the room this morning. Father, we just thank you for today. God, I know as we open up this series on spiritual warfare, and we just see a couple of pieces of the armor coupled with some pieces of, Lord, the, the fruit, God, and seeing how they work together. I just pray that you would open up our, our hearts and our minds, Lord. Give us spiritual eyes and ears to see and hear things that we've never seen and heard in this season. Give us the ability to war like we've never warred before, God, on, on your behalf and on our behalf and on our family's behalf and, and on our city's behalf and our, 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 our state and our nation's behalf, Father. I, I pray for that today. And I thank you so much for it. God, we love you this morning. And we're so grateful. And Father, also today, the thing that I've been praying for um, this whole week is souls. I've just been praying for souls because it's the, it's, it's the main thing we're battling about. It's the soul of a human. It's the main thing we're fighting for. It's the souls of humans that we get to spend eternity together as, as the family of God. And so my question today all over the room would be this. There might be some of you with heads bowed, eyes closed. There might be some of you and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And if that's you this morning, man, the Lord has brought you here for such an opportunity to give your life to Him and to get on the journey that we would call um, Christianity, the journey that we would call salvation and, and being able to, to start right here today. And, and if that's you this morning, the scripture says, call upon the name of the Lord and you would be saved. Like, it's, it's not our words, but it's our heart to his heart. And his heart is towards you this morning. And so right there where you are, you know, I, I can lead you through a, a prayer and you can pray these words, but I mean, I'm believing it's your heart to his heart today. And just right there where you are this morning, you can say it with me. Just say, Lord. And just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I've learned to tell him more than once. I think sometimes I, he may not be listening to me. And so say it again like, Lord Jesus, I need you. I want to thank you today, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me that covers my sin. And I want to thank you today, Jesus, for dying on a cross for me. Right here and right now. I confess and repent of my sin. And I open the door of my life and I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. And I thank you today for forgiving my sins, Jesus. Right here and right now, I ask that you would take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer this morning, please mark it on that connection card. We want to be able to connect with you. We want to be able to walk this walk with you um, and, and be able to, to help you, you know, not just for a few days or weeks or months, but for the rest of your life um, as you walk out uh, this journey.